Hi, I'm Megan Conway. I'm a children's librarian at the Tates Creek Branch Library. And I've been a children's librarian for a little over 25 years. And in that time, I've seen books come and go and come back again. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Books that have been re-illustrated or reissued with brand new pictures. Sometimes books that you're very, very familiar with. And it leaves you thinking, why did they do that? And so I hope you'll enjoy some of these examples. One of the first times I noticed this, books being re-illustrated, with, was with a book called Oonga Boonga. And I loved this book because I used to read it to my nieces when they were little. Several years after this was published, lo and behold, another version came up with totally different illustrations. And I wondered why that happened. Um, and I thought about it and did a little investigating. And I realized it's kind of a common thing for among children's books to have new pictures when the book is reissued. And there's several reasons for that. One, probably most important reason, is sometimes the books become out of date. A perfect example of that is Ruth Krauss's The Growing Book uh, with pictures by Phyllis Rowland. And, you know, this was done in 1947. And if you look at the pictures, it looks very out of date. Even though vintage pictures, retro style, is a trend that's coming back, and, and now you'll see a lot of books that have uh, sort of a mid-century look to it, this just doesn't uh, do very well in this time period. So the book was re-illustrated. It's a great story, so it's a good thing that it was reissued, but Helen Oxenberry now has uh, done the illustrations, and you'll probably agree that it's a much more colorful, uh, much more successful book for today's age. Another reason books might be re-illustrated re is that uh, they may have been originally published in a smaller version. Here's Morris's Disappearing Bag by Rosemary Wells and The, missing, the Mystery of the Missing Red Mitten by Stephen Kellogg. You can see the difference. Here's Morris in his new version. With The Mystery of the Missing Red Mitten, this book was done in black and white drawings with just a spot of color all throughout, the missing red mitten, obviously. When it was re-illustrated by Stephen Kellogg, the original illustrator and author, he made it bigger, much more colorful, and he even changed the story. So new printing technology gave, him, gave his books a new life, and he was excited about that. So when it came time to make a new edition of The Mysterious Tadpole, for the book's 25th anniversary. Stephen Kellogg jumped on that chance and he made full color pictures. Again, he changed the story because he had always wanted to develop the characters more. Now that he's a much more successful author with many more books under his belt, he had the power and the authority to do that. Whereas when Mysterious Tadpole was first published, you know, he, he didn't have as much leeway with his editor, I think, and couldn't develop the characters in the way that he wanted. But this raises a question. Everybody fell in love with this version of The Mysterious Tadpole. It was a hugely successful book, helped make Stephen Kellogg uh, the star author that he is. So when he changed the story and changed the illustrations, well, what does that do with the book that you grew up and you loved? It's still a great book, but it's just an interesting question to ponder. People become very attached to books that they read as a child, and they become attached to the illustrations. Now, I want you to think. Think of Little House on the Prairie and picture in your mind what that book looks like, and I'll bet it looks like this with illustrations by Garth Williams. Well, Garth Williams was not the first to illustrate this book, and I was surprised to find that out. Actually, the first illustrator was Helen Sewell. There's an old, old copy, and the uh, pictures are in pretty much black and white. Well, all black and white. There might be a, a little bit of color in there. But this is the one we're familiar with, the Garth, Garth Williams version. And so in 2007, I believe it was, when the publisher decided to reissue the paperbacks, they removed all of the illustrations and put a photograph on the cover. And this was really, really derided. People did not like this. Little House fans, this is their Little House. Now, with the 75th anniversary of the Little House books, those pictures were colorized. Instead of the black and white uh, charcoal pencil drawings that Garth Williams did, you have color versions. 
Garth Williams obviously is, is um, dead by now, he's deceased, but uh, his pictures were recolored, and you wonder what he would think about that. But our new audiences today, children today, they kind of want color. Um, black and white is, that's old, that's their parents, or they're even their grandparents' books. So a lot of books are being recolored. There's a new book, a new Hanukkah book out, called The Hanukkah Bear, and it's by Eric Kimmel, with pictures by Mike Wonutka. Now, this book first came out in a version called The Hanukkah Guest. Or actually, it first came out in a magazine, Cricket Magazine. This was the first book version, with pictures by Giora Carmi. Eric Kimmel said about this book that the, the woman, Bubba Brena, in the book, looked just like his grandmother. He said Giora Carmi had never seen a picture of his grandmother, but it just so happened that the drawing that he did made uh, Bubba Brena look just like Eric Kimmel's grandmother. So when this book came out, people wondered, is this supposed to be Bubba Brena? She doesn't look 97 years old. And I have a friend that was really, really disappointed in the new version, even though it's bright and colorful and it still retains the story of Bubba Brena and how she mistakes a bear for her rabbi on a Hanukkah night. But um, this is the book that my friend grew up with and loved. A really perfect example of the way that uh, memory is seated in the heart, as Tennessee Williams said, is with the book's scary stories to tell in the dark. This is more scary stories to tell in the dark, but people grew up with this book and it scared the wits out of them. Uh, Stephen Gamble did the illustrations and the illustrations are so spooky, even more spooky than the stories. So when the new version came out for the 30th anniversary with pictures by Brett Helquist, people went nuts. There, are, If you look on the internet, and just look for um, scary stories, Brett Helquist. You will find reviews, articles, uh, editorials about how they ruined scary stories with the new illustrations. Poor Brett Helquist, he's just doing his job. He was a successful illustrator with the um, series of Unfortunate Events books, but somehow the, the, his illustrations are just not as scary as uh, Stephen Gamble's. And so, Really, people fell in love with the original. You have to wonder, why did the publisher decide to change this one? As you've seen, a lot of books are re-illustrated or reissued when the anniversary of the book comes up. Mark Brown, his first book about Arthur was called Arthur's Nose. Now, if you look at Arthur, he's a lot different than the little guy you see on TV or in some of the newer books. In the 25th anniversary edition, uh, Mark Brown, has hit the current Arthur reading the cover of the original. And inside, he, he kept his original pictures. That's kind of different uh, from what some other illustrators do, Stephen Kellogg, for example. But Mark Brown kept his original illustrations. What he did, though, is that he gave an introduction to the book that showed how Arthur developed through time, how his nose kind of shortened through the years and how he ended up looking the way that he looks now. Uh, it's really fascinating, and so uh, I was really pleased with this 25th anniversary edition. It was a way to um, honor the original, but also to show people that, um, you know, time moves on and, and artist styles change. Now, often when a book is reissued, it's because the publisher or the editor decides, or maybe even the author decides, that uh, it's time to put this book out again. It's gone out of print, but it was a good story, and maybe its time has come again. There was a book called Thanksgiving at the Tappletons by Eileen Spinelli and uh, Marilyn Coco, Mary Ann Coco Leffler did the pictures. It's about a family that has a disastrous Thanksgiving. When it was reissued by the publisher, the new pictures were done by Megan Lloyd. So it was the same author, but the publisher or the editor decided to go in a different direction and and uh, hire a different illustrator to do the pictures. And with this one, I thought it was interesting that it went from human characters to animal characters. And you know, I think you see that sometimes in books. Um, it could just be the personal preference of the illustrator. They just might like animals. But sometimes I think it um, gives a more universal appeal to the book. In the original story, it was a Caucasian family, um, had a specific look. Your family might not look like that, but Everybody can 
I guess, relate to a family of wolves because you have to put yourself in their place. And you could be anybody reading this book about fam a family of wolves. I just thought that was an interesting example of how sometimes a, a story can stay the same, but the illustrations change because somebody has a different take on it. Now, other times, as you've seen in other examples, an illustrator, author illustrator, will re-illustrate their own work. Tommy DePaola has redone several of his books, and one example is Nana Upstairs, Nana Downstairs. When he did this book, he had a different style of illustrating. When he reissued it, or his publisher reissued it, the pictures are in color, and part of that reason is that technology has changed, printing processes have changed, and uh, you can do more, more color in a book. It's less expensive than it used to be, it's easier. Well, when Tommy DePaola redid Nana Upstairs, Nana Downstairs, he tried to um, make it very close to the original, but he just couldn't do it because after all these years, he said he just doesn't draw in the same way that he used to. So sometimes if you see a re-illustration or a reissue of a book and it looks drastically different, it's just because the illustrator is different. His, the way he does things is different. One of the most interesting examples of that, I think, is with Eric Carle's books, or some of Eric Carle's books. I'm a little bit ashamed to say that I work, have worked at libraries for years and years and didn't realize until a few years ago that Brown Bear, Brown Bear actually has new illustrations. I don't know why, I thought it was just the same book. When it was first issued, Eric Carle, or first illustrated, Eric Carle did it with uh, commercially available tissue paper and he you know he takes the tissue paper cuts it out he may uh, paint on it or draw on it so he did the original brown bear brown bear by written by bill martin jr and these illustrations that he did they didn't last over time the sun faded this paper he learned that after this first book and subsequent books to this one his, his style of illustration changed just simply because he saw that this paper didn't last. When the publisher wanted to reissue Brown Bear, Brown Bear, for a, I, I think it might have been an anniversary edition, he went back and looked at his original illustrations and realized that they were damaged, they just, they couldn't be used again. So he just redid it. And his style had changed because he's using different art materials because uh, the first book that he did, he realized those art materials didn't work. So you can see a real difference. He now paints on white tissue paper. He actually paints it, then he cuts out the parts and puts them together in a collage. And uh, the same story, the only difference at the end you might know is that um, it says, instead of it saying, I see a mother looking at me, it says, I see a teacher looking at me. And for a long time I thought that was the only difference, but now you can see a very different book but it's the same story with the same animals and I just thought that was a really interesting example. Now Emily Arnold McCulley she has re-illustrated several of her books. There's a series of little books uh, there's First Snow which is the one I'm showing you there's Picnic I think another one is called School. Well they came out in a kind of a little compact edition beautiful pictures inside and it was a wordless book. Emily Arnold McCulley's editor said that this book didn't need words. It was originally, her concept was to write a story to go with it, but her editor decided that the pictures stood alone. I mean, told the story all by themselves. So, when the book was reissued, I was very excited because it was big and, you know, children's librarians like bigger books because we can use them in story time and the kids can see the pictures better. So this was great. And I opened up the book and I thought, this is wonderful. The, the pictures look exactly the same. But you know, if you look closely, these books, she redrew or repainted all of these pictures. They look the same, but little hints will show you that these are brand new pictures. But the thing I object to in this book is that words have been added. Now, it's not even a story. It's little things that like, um, there's a picture that says, that was great with the mice sledding down the hill. There might be a picture that says, uh, look, there's little bitty. 
up at the top of the hill. It's things that you might say when you're looking at a wordless book and you might say that to your child, oh look, there's little bitty on the top of the hill. Well, I wonder why do they need to put that in a book? Can't we figure out how to say that on our own? So I, I was really uh, confused why this book needed words, but I do like the new pictures and I like the bigger size and just think it's fascinating that she was able to repaint the pictures and make them look so much like the original. Some books become so identified with their illustrations that the illustrations are almost icons of the book. Um, the Little Engine That Could, we all know this, uh, by Waddy Piper, and by the way, Waddy Piper is a pseudonym for um, one of the publishers. This was published by Platt and Monk. Well, it was Mr. Monk's uh, that took the name Waddy Piper. But Waddy Piper, or Mr. Monk, did not write this story originally. There's a fascinating website. If you look up um, In Search of Waddy Piper, you'll get the whole history of The Little Engine That Could. And it was originally illustrated by um, Lois Linsky, who you might know from her many, many children's books. But the iconic illustrations are these done by George and Doris Howman. The little blue engine against the orange sky. And so it was no surprise when Lauren Long came out with an edition. It has new art by Lauren Long. It's the same exact story. And even though he has a very different style from the original, he kept the orange sky, he kept almost the same shade of the little blue engine, and if you look at the pictures inside, you'll see there's a similarity, even though he has such a different style. But it's because this wouldn't be the little engine that could if it didn't give you some hint of the little blue engine and the orange sky and the little clown and the giraffes with their necks sticking out of the train. There's a book by Sims Tabak called Joseph Had a Little Overcoat. That's an old story, a folk tale, and it was a song. But Sims Tabak took this story and he did it with die cuts. Inside, as you turn the pages, the coat uh, changes from a coat to a jacket, to a vest, to a tie, to a button. You know the story. Well, this was not the original. Sims Tabak actually illustrated this or wrote this and illustrated it back in the 1970s. If you look at the afterword of the new edition, he tells you about it. He said that when he first published this in the 70s, he was so proud of this book and he also did it with die cut illustrations. And he said that um, there wasn't a market at that time for ethnic books. And so his book didn't do very well. When he won the Caldecott Medal for uh, I know an old lady who swallowed a fly, which was done in illustrations very similar to this new edition of um, Joseph Warren Little Overcoat. When he did, I know an old lady who swallowed a fly and won the Caldecott and had such success with that, he thought now's the time to bring back Joseph Had a Little Overcoat. And so he redid that in the style of the Little Old Lady book. And it, it's such a wonderful book, so I was excited to find his original and to see the differences. The layout of each scene is the same, but of course he's done his new one in a collage style where the old one was done in drawings with color. So an original book that when re-illustrated became a, a hit and became actually one a Caldecott. A really interesting and controversial example of um, a Caldecott metal book being re-illustrated was with Many Moons. Many Moons by James Thurber, illustrated by Louis Slobodkin. This book won the Caldecott Award. And it, for many, many years, it did fine. The publisher decided to reissue it with new illustrations. What an amazing decision. Why would you re-illustrate a book that won an award for its illustrations? Well, this is one of those examples of a book that the pictures maybe didn't hold up through time because of uh, when it was originally published, there was limited technology and, uh, lim and with the color separation, the way that they did the printing, you couldn't use a lot of color. It was very, very expensive. So perhaps that was the reason that the, um, the book was re-illustrated. So the publisher asked the family if that was okay. They were kind of dumbstruck because 
this was their father's award-winning book. Why would it be re-illustrated? But they thought about it, and when they found out that the publisher wanted to uh, have Mark Simont re-illustrate it, they decided to go ahead. Mark Simont was a friend of James Thurber's, and they knew that he had actually illustrated some of his other books, and they decided to take that chance. It's a very successful book. Uh, some people, when it came out, were not pleased, were thought that the publisher was uh, doing something sacrilegious by re-illustrating a Caldecott award-winning book. But now we have two editions. We have the original, which thankfully has stayed in print, and the new edition. To me, the really most fascinating example of a Caldecott medal-winning book being re-illustrated was with the book Abraham Lincoln. The Dallaire's famous for their stone lithography, uh, did the pictures for this book. They actually wrote it and, and did the illustrations. They used stone lithography and literally they would etch their pictures onto huge slabs of stone. It was an, it was an award-winning book, as I said, and the pictures are beautiful, but the publisher, every time it had to reprint the book, had to use these huge, massive stones. And there's a lot of illustrations in this book. The publisher finally had to put their foot down. They told the Dolaires, we can't do this anymore. It's so unwieldy. You have to re-illustrate this book. Redo your pictures, but do it on plates that are much lighter. So the Dolaires agreed to redo their pictures, but they weren't happy about it. So to distinguish between the two editions, they put in a few little inside jokes of their own. The pictures are almost exactly alike between the two editions but there are, there are a few differences. There's an example of a man talking to Abraham Lincoln and his arm is down by his side. In the new edition, his arm is sticking out. That's how you know you have uh, the original or whether you have the reissue, whether the man's arm is sticking out or is down by his side. There's another picture that in the background, there's a, a man with a wagon. In the new version of it, uh, the, instead of a man with a wagon, there's a man with a plow. Just little things all throughout the book, kind of a little joke. So it's fun to take these two editions and to compare them. Well, for a long time, you could not find the original edition because, of course, it went out of print. But luckily, a small publisher has decided to reissue the original illustrations. And so if you, uh, if you look in some libraries, you'll find a brand new copy of the Abraham Lincoln book by the Dolaires with the original illustrations. I found out about this Lincoln book when I read an article about Caldecott medals and the author of the article was saying, okay, so this new edition has new pictures. They look virtually the same, although there are differences. The original won the Caldecott medal, so does that mean the new one? Is that a Caldecott medal winning book? Of course it is, but still gives you something to think about. Thank you for watching. If you want to know more about these books and other books that have been re-illustrated or revised, go to the website I've set up called Classics Re-Illustrated, Everything Old is New Again, and you'll see examples of these books. You can click on some of the pictures, see them up close, and hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about the publishing world and about illustrations and about these classic books that have been given new life. Thank you.